Ah, how the mighty do fall. This applies as much to economies as it does to business groups and business leaders. Welcome to the discussion on cars, spies, and global governance. Back in the 1980s, Japan was seen as the ultimate economy in terms of everything from how well that system operated to the absolute cutting edge nature of the way its businesses operated. And while Japan still has many economic fundamentals that make it a powerful economy today, what happened at the end of this run up of fame and fortune was that an asset bubble collapsed and you saw decades of lost economic growth. By the late 1990s, Japanese auto brands, which had once epitomized the country's industrial might, were suffering. Nissan in particular was just about bankrupt before Renault came in and basically salvaged it through a massive investment to alleviate some of its very high levels of debt. With its 36.6% stake in Nissan, Renault brought in Carlos Ghosn to help turn things around. Within one year, he brought the company back to profitability through very innovative approaches towards building a new corporate culture that relied on cross-functional team building. Now that might sound like another triumph of great corporate management, but bear in mind this all took place in Japan, a country famous for rejecting foreign involvement in its economy and society. So for an outsider like Gon to come in and do what he accomplished was no small feat. With this kind of remarkable success, Gon became lionized internationally as well as in Japan. He was seen as a hero, someone who showed a new way forward for Japan Inc. in a truly globalized economy. Nearly 20 years into this phenomenal success, you could say that Gon became a victim both of what he had accomplished physically within the operations of the company as well as mentally. There were several factors at play here. Number one, Nissan was doing so well it was outperforming Renault, thereby straining the alliance. You also had some jockeying for power as Gon was getting close to retirement and moving his way out of the company. And finally, you had Gon himself who had let success get to his head and used creative accounting to enrich himself. This was not only unseemly according to Japanese business practice, it was in fact illegal, not just in Japan, but according to lawsuits, also the US and France itself. As if that wasn't saga enough, things got really interesting at the end of 2019 when Gon was smuggled out by an ex-Green Beret he hired to take him in a crate that allowed him to get out of Japan and back to his home country of Lebanon. While Gon earned a lot of sympathy abroad, he was vilified in Japan where he had been demoted from hero to scandalous villain. To adequately address the merits and demerits of the Japanese legal system would require another video, but very quickly to point out Japanese, by and large, appreciate its efficiency and its ability to build on social harmony as opposed to the notion of justice we tend to appreciate elsewhere, which is that the truth is brought out through a protection of individual rights. Now, Gon seems to have been in violation of some laws, but it's definitely the case that what he experienced in Japan is pretty unique to what you see in Asia as opposed to other parts of the world. And that represents a major disconnect for not just Japan, but much of Asia with a global legal system. As that very cursory analysis of Japanese justice showed, corporate governance on a global scale is gonna remain a hot topic as long as there are divergent views on what is and isn't just. And a final point, Japan's rise and then, although not a fall, plateauing, holds a lot of lessons for other East Asian economies China in particular. We'll leave a more rigorous comparison between the Japanese and Chinese economies to a later installment. In the meantime, I want to thank you, welcome your comments as well as subscription.